we are very happy to have this next panel uh, that's looking at race and pride in the LGBTQ community. And I really want to thank all the participants that are going to be joining us. And I will start reading some of their bios and you'll learn a little bit more about the work that they do. So the first person that I'm going to read, this is an alphabetical order, so no particular order, but uh, is Mohammed Q. Amin who is the founder and executive director of the Caribbean Equality Project, which we had the very um, special opportunity to work with last year at the Center for a wonderful exhibition called Queer Caribbeans of New York, Stonewall 50. Um, he's the director of Caribbean Equality Project and is a pioneering Indo-Caribbean and queer Muslim and human and Im immigrant rights activist a native of Guyana who resides in Richmond Hill, New York. And on the eve of 2013 NYC Pride Parade, Amin and his siblings were viciously attacked for being members of the LGBTQ community in their Southeast Queens neighborhood. Uh, in response to anti-LGBTQ hate violence in two, 2015, he founded the Caribbean Equality Project, a nonprofit organization that advocates for Caribbean LGBTQ plus voices in New York City. Amin applies his professional expertise as well as his drive, excuse me, as well as his drive to bring about uh, social issues to gender equality, gender equity, social justice, to ending gender-based and anti-LGBTQ hate violence, racism, anti-transgender violence, and dismantling systems of oppression. The next person that's with us is Antoine Craigwell, a journalist. Antoine worked for, wrote for several local and national publications. He graduated from Bernard Baruch College of the City of New York. And in 2008, he earned awards for the New York Association of Black Journalists. He also produced the documentary, You Are Not Alone, which will share information in one of the tickers below and facilitates discussions and forums on depression and black gay men. He presented a poster exhibition examining depression and HIV in the Black Gay Men at the 2012 International AIDS Conference in Washington, D.C. And in 2013, he founded DBGM Incorporated, which is Depressed Black Gay Men. Um, so it's www.dbgm.org, which is a nonprofit organization committed to raising awareness of the un underlying factors contributing to depression and suicidal ideation in Black Gay Men. Carmen Neely, I'm very happy to work with in this event, it hails from Charlotte, North Carolina. She graduated from Howard University with a BFA in theater and a minor in film production. She also holds a Master of Science in Teaching with specializations in childhood and special education from Fordham University. Very close to Fordham University, Carmen. <laughs> Upon arriving in New York City, Carmen worked at Manhattan Theater Club, first in ticket sales. I had that job too at one point. Then as general management assistant. Later, Carmen worked as an executive administrative assistant at Goldman Sachs. Most recently, she worked in the New York City Department of Education as a special education teacher. So shout out to all the teachers out there doing that work. Thank you for doing that. Carmen Neely is also the co-founder and president of Harlem Pride. Harlem Pride is Harlem's LGBTQ pride organization, and its mission is to empower Harlem's LGBTQ community, which includes families, friends, and allies, to improve physical, mental, and economic health and wellness. Though Carmen is quite busy managing Harlem Pride, she's also an active member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, and other Harlem-based LGBTQ organizations. She's co-chair of the LGBTQ committee of the NAACP, Mid-Manhattan Branch, a co-chair of the Black and Latino LGBTQ Coalition, a board member of the LGBT Faith Leaders of African Descent, Director of Communications at Rivers of Living Water Ministries, UCC, a board member of the Harlem SGL LGBTQ Center, and a co-chair of the New York City Pride and Power and political club. So thank you for that. Thank you for all, all of you for all the amazing work that you do. Next up is Javon Martin. For over 25 years, Javon has been a mentor, educator, advocate, volunteer, and house father in the ballroom community. 
one of his strong focuses being homelessness, homelessness within the TGLBQI plus population. Javon presently serves as CEO of Princess Janae Place, which he founded in 2015. Princess Janae Place is a referral organization for TLGBQI plus services with an emphasis on the homelessness, the homeless population. Those services include mental, medical, legal, mental health, and recreational services. He's a proud brother of the first trans men fraternity, Theta Beta Chi, and has helped change legislation for marriage equality and gender in New York City. So thank you for, for that service too. As well as getting the age raise for homelessness, homeless youth from 24 to 26. Javon has worked for the MTA as a conductor, a peer educator, HIV test counselor, and a resounding voice in the community. He has helped build brotherhood among black trans men in New York City and around the country. He also facilitates workshops, seminars, keynote speakers, and is unapologetically speaking out on issues that affect the TLGBI with an emphasis on transgender population. Javon has been awarded the 2015 Man of the Year, the Octavia St. Laurent Trans Activist Award, the 2014 Marsha P. Johnson Award. Got her right here, keeping me company. Uh, Pioneer Chris Award, the 2017 Circle of Life Person of Trans Experience Award, and many, many, many others. With the model that is part of his daily inspiration, which is, if not now, when, if not me, then who? Be the change the world needs today for a better tomorrow. Javon Martin is just doing that. So thank you all. If you just want to take this time now to unmute yourself, we can start having this conversation too. Um, so as we were planning this, this conversation, you know, we really wanted to address some of the issues that were going, uh, that are going on in our communities, especially when we talk about the role of racism and race within our own LGBTQ plus communities, which is a thing and happens. So before we start getting into the meat of the, the conversation, I really would appreciate if we can all just do a quick round robin and share about two minutes of the work that they do, that, that each of your respective organizations or organizations that you've worked with or are part of, obviously based on these bios that I've read, you guys are involved in many, many, many different places. And even though sometimes we might not work in those spaces anymore, that we're, we're still involved in some capacity. So I wanna start off with Antoine um, and then go around to Mohammed, Javon, and then Carmen to talk about two minutes time as best as we can to talk about the work that you do and, and then we'll, we'll take it from there. Thank you very much, uh, Richard, for um, inviting me to be part of this um, wide celebration at the center. And I'm actually very interested that you should choose to focus on race and racism, um, which is a key issue in the LGBT community, um, which we can talk about a little later on. Um, my work that a lot of the work that I've been doing, I know you only read part of my bio, but a lot of work that I've been engaged in um, is really a lot of activity advocacy and activism around uh, mental health for LGBT people of color communities, but also um, raising more awareness um, about racism um, and its insidious and effects in, um, in the LGBT community and at large in um, black communities as well as in white communities. And so for example, I am a member of the statewide multicultural advisory council that advises the commission of the Office of Mental Health. Um, and one of the things I just I just pioneered, I just issued a, on behalf, I wrote a statement um, calling on the OMA to recognize racism as an essential integral part of the OMH's functioning and calling for change. I'm also part of the LGBT Community Service Board sub, subcommittee of the Department of Health in New York City. And so I'm challenging them as well to examine their racist policies and, and inclusion, uh, more race and LGBT inclusion in the, uh, in the DOH. Um, 
And among DBGM, in our organization, we are talking about a lot of work about uh, mental health for gay men of color and for women of color, not necessarily gay, but women of color, um, so as to talk about HIV prevention through the perspective of mental health. Um, the other thing that we got coming up and that we do is a conference on mental health. So this year, we're, this is our, we are sixth year this year, and we're talking about the environment in me. It's going to be on October 8th, and we're talking about how does the environment, um, both external and internal, impact our mental health. Um, so that's coming up this year. It's going to be virtual. And we are partnering with you guys at the center to host this conference virtually. Um, right now, we've got a commitment from a U.S. Congresswoman who has sponsored a bill in Congress about LGBT global issues. So she is committed to being one of our speakers. And we've got a commitment from a deputy commissioner from the New York City Department of Health to focus on how HIV impacts our mental health um, as LGBT people of color. So that's just a couple of things that we got going on. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And, you know, it's it's really been a great pleasure to work with you on the In My Mind conference and also some of these conversations such as uh, um, COVID-19 and my mental health. And then I know you also had a conversation with Javon about homelessness um, in, to, in today's world right now. So um, so thank you for that work. Next up, I want to move to Mohammed who, like I mentioned before, we had the wonderful opportunity to present this really important um, exhibition called Queer Caribbeans of New York Stonewall 50th uh, at the center. But I would love to hear a little bit more about the work that you do and continue to do at the Caribbean Equality Project. Thank you, Richard. I'm so honored to be a part of this conversation. Uh, I feel racism has somehow always been a part of my life. Um, I live in Richmond Hill, Queens, which is predominantly an Indo-Caribbean community. Being an immigrant in this country, I've experienced racism back in my own country, um, but also have experienced it here in New York City as well. So I'm, I'm happy that we're having this conversation during Pride Month as we also stand in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement. The work I do with the Caribbean Equality Project uh, stemmed from my family and I surviving an anti-LGBTQ hate crime incident in 2013, where my brother was left hospitalized and it took us almost two years to really recover from that incident, from learning about counseling services that were available. To, that were available. We also realized within our own Caribbean LGBTQ community, we were not having conversations around mental health and we were not having conversations around what safety looks like within cultural spaces that are meant to celebrate Caribbean culture and uplift Caribbean uh, identities. And I've always talked about the intersectionality of Caribbeanness and what it means to be a queer person and a Caribbean person living in a diaspora. And in 2015, uh, Andy Bishun and Krishna Ramsaran and I, uh, we founded the Caribbean Equality Project. And yesterday was actually our, officially was our fifth anniversary. We launched the same day that the Supreme Court passed um, the Marriage Equality Act. And that was an intentional choice for us. We said we were either going to continue fighting to be acknowledged and to also love who we love and how we love but to also make sure that this work that we're doing, Caribbean LGBTQ immigrants were also a part of this work. And when we talk about intersectionality and when we talk about um, black trans lives and when we talk about healthcare equity, all of these issues are also Caribbean LGBTQ issues. So majority of the work for the past five years have been about creating safe and affirming spaces for LGBTQ immigrants. We founded Unchained, which is a five-year running support group. Last year, we have a, we started to sort of reflect what is the history of Caribbean LGBTQ immigrants in New York City. So many folks have come before myself 
And we wanted to honor those folks. So we created the Queer Caribbeans of NYC exhibition. We honored 22 activists, including Colin Robinson and Dominique Jackson and Kim Watson. These are all pioneering activists in New York, including Tina from Chutney Pride. And we also wanted to make sure that the, the history of Caribbean immigrants were also recorded in New York City. Uh, we also founded My Truth, My Story, which is a one of the first um, queer Caribbean oral history project. And most notably, Dominique Jackson is one of our participants for that project, and she's currently starring on Pose. And these stories are available as an educational tool, but also for, the, for our wider LGBTQ community and allies to learn about the struggles of Caribbean immigrants living in a diaspora and why some of us flee for safety. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. And I, I believe people can check out the Caribbean Equalities website, which will will run on the bottom if people want to know a little bit more. Uh, so for those of you out there on the internet, please take this time to start thinking of questions and feel free to drop them in any of the chats that are either on Facebook Live at the time or on YouTube Live. So. We'll move on to Javon and then Carmen. So just, you know, brief two minutes so that way we can have enough time to to get into some of the meteor components. So Javon, if you don't if you don't mind talking a little bit about Princess Janae Place. Okay. Um so I started Princess Janae Place in 2015 in honor of uh, Princess Janae, and she passed away in 2013 of lymphoma cancer. And uh, what better way to honor her legacy is to um, open um, a homeless organization in her honor. Janae was homeless herself many years ago. She used to live out of a U-Haul truck, but she found a way and she made a way to open up her home for several people. Um, and um, Mohammed mentioned um, Dominique. Dominique used to live with Janae many years ago. She was a mother uh, to a lot of people in the community. And I used to stay with her just because that's what I wanted to do. I wasn't homeless, but her door was open and she was a fun person to be around. And she she took me in, um, showed me how to do uh, drag. I was a drag king. And um, I, I am just forever indebted to her for instilling in me a lot of the qualities that I have today. And um, she said it, on camera when um, Luna uh, filmed her that don't let nobody tell you what you cannot do and who you cannot be. So I took that and, and I held on to that. And I'm and I'm also, you know, telling the, the younger people that, you know, you you can do whatever you set your heart to, you know, and we're here to to help and to assist. So with Princess Janae plays we are a referral organization that help people get to where they need, whether it be housing, legal services, healthcare, and also recreational um, services. Uh, we started the first homeless walk here in New York with over 80,000 homeless people in New York. We never had a homeless walkathon. And we started the first one three years ago. Uh, this year, we're having a virtual homeless walk due to COVID-19. It's August 30th. And um, we, we've always been taking care of our own people. And, and the trans community has, has always been so resilient, right? With, with everything that's thrown at us, we still rise above. So Princess Janae Place is here and, and, and we're here to help anyone that needs services. We don't turn anyone away. And we advocate for um, housing. We, we talk to the landlords and the realtors so that they don't discriminate against anyone. So um, we're here at Princess Janae Place, and um, thank you for having this panel. This is very much needed. We appreciate this. Hi, well, basically for me, representing as co-chair of the Black and Latino LGBTQ Coalition, as well as president of Harlem Pride, a lot of what we've brought to the community, I feel is more like a cultural awareness of the need for uh, programs and services where we live, 
and that goes for uh, the establishment of a community center here in Harlem is one thing we've worked on collectively, as well as just bringing a uh, more culturally competent for the African-American and Latino community, pride organization and celebration that's a little different than perhaps the mainstream. And, you know, just because we do some things that are more germane to our culture, like a Juneteenth type celebration, or uh, we tend to honor different people in the community who made a difference for us, uh, doesn't mean that we somehow are separate ourselves. You know, basically it's just our time to honor what we do and how we do it, basically. So, I mean, there is racism definitely that we experience. And uh, unfortunately, we still continue to see that in the larger community. And, uh, you know, with Black Lives Matter, I'm glad that it's really coming to the forefront because this country has had over 400 years of racism uh, that we've dealt with. And I feel very optimistic about the future because we really are addressing Black Lives Matter in a very large national way. And um, we continue to do that. Uh, we are part of the Harlem Pride is gonna be part of a mural that's being painted here in Harlem and other things like that. So uh, we're happy with the work that we're doing and moving and shaking in the community. Thank you. And you know, that, that, that you mentioned a couple of things that lead into some of the questions that I want to, I want all of us to, to, to think about um, and conversations that you and I've had before this um, with regards to racism within LGBTQ organizations, but also to look at not just the organizations itself, but but organizing in general, you know, oftentimes it's like we have to work with other organizations or other communities in order to get things done. And sometimes, you know, it's so um, silent in a way where it comes out in these kind of like small microaggressions, for instance, or this constant questioning of, of worth. But I wanted to talk to you about, you know, how do you see the organizations that you've been a part of, um, how do you, how do how do you see race and racism play out in some of those spaces? But then we also talked about um, how organizing within the LGBTQ communities have been impacted by some of these um, issues of race and racism. And how have you seen that play about? And and how, what what have your responses been to that? Or what have other people told you about that? as one part of the question. And then the second part is that, you know, we, we discussed this, this uh, distinction between activism and advocacy. Can you talk a little bit about what your thoughts are between the two? Who was the question directed This is, to? I'm sorry, this is for Carmen. Okay, uh, thank you, Richard. Well, basically I would respond um, in terms of my personal experience. I have seen, let's say politically, for example, um, I would say the larger LGBTQ community rallied behind marriage equality. And while that's definitely important, uh, when you look at blacks and people of color who are part of the LGBTQ community, we have other issues that we would prioritize because when you see us, right away you see our skin color. And that is uh, the way we move within society. So we might, choose police reform, we might choose housing or uh, prioritize issues such as that over marriage equality, while we definitely felt marriage equality was important. And so when it comes down to sometimes uh, rallying for political policies here in New York City, as well as New York State, we can differ greatly from what might be the majority uh, priority as to what we need to back and what we need to push and, and just prioritizing different things. Uh, so that's just one example. Um, another example in terms of advocacy is um, being able to have services and programs right here where we live. When we first had the push collectively for a community center here in Harlem, there were all kinds of accusations about, oh, did you experience racism downtown? 
Uh, I heard, oh, you guys want to take money from down, like all these sort of malicious sorts of motivations. Mm -hmm. And it's really just as simple as you have fire stations, libraries, hospitals all over the city. Why can't mm -hmm. there be a service community center programs and all of that right in our community where we live? Why should a 13 year old have to get on the subway and go all the way downtown when they can have a center that they can walk to and have e easier access to. So it, it's amazing to me how just self-advocating for our uh, community can turn into such a political issue when it's really just a simple uh, need of having services where we live. So those are two examples of things that um, I've experienced personally in terms of just racism or also just general not understanding or considering the the lived experiences of African Americans and people of color in this society. Um, again, I, I guess it goes to some level of privilege because you don't have the majority of the LGBTQ community having to deal with the same issues. But the moment we walk out the door, the first thing is skin color that people see. And as a quote unquote minority, then we have to n navigate that. So it's not necessarily my being a lesbian that lesbian that is first on someone's mind. I'm a black woman first, and then a lesbian, and then the whole gamut, teacher, sister, friend, et cetera, that of the various identities that I hold. And so it's definitely a different experience, a different way of navigating uh, political needs, advocacy needs, program and service needs, and, and the whole realm really does, unfortunately, in this society stem from those sorts of issues. Mm -hmm. Thank you for, for sharing that. And part of when, when you were talking about that makes me think of um, fundraising and funds that are available. And it, I've, I've seen it from other organizations that I've worked with where it's almost like 20 times harder for organizations of color to apply for funding that other organizations. It's almost like because they have the relationships with the banks or the, you know, the higher ups, it's a lot easier seamless for that and you know i always think that it's it's really important that first off we put our money where our, our mouth is and we we also support um other organizations that aren't necessarily just white organizations but yes. that can lead us to a larger conversation key. visibility is key so um yeah. you know uh, people go to what they know so you have to make sure you're what they know yeah and one of the things too is like, you know, with World Pride, we saw everybody have a rainbow everywhere and, and you know, like everybody was celebrating some kind of pride marketing tool or campaign. And my thoughts were always like, okay, well, you know, let's, let's like, let's see the receipts, you know, let's see, let's hold you accountable for not just this, this particular month, but afterwards. And so right now, we're seeing a different landscape, especially when we talk about, you know, like Black Lives Matter or Black Trans Lives and things like that, and people stepping up to that. I'm sure many of you have received those emails from all the organizations about that. You know, the same thing to, you know, I think it's also really important for us to be vigilant and hold these organizations that are spreading these messages right now as accountable as some of the other organizations from, from years past. but. Um, I, I want to move on into talking about um, Princess Janae Place. And, you know, I, I know you mentioned a little bit about the, the history of the organization. I'm just curious from even the conversation that you had with Antoine recently, you know, like how you see the current situation right now play, being played out with TGNC communities, transgender communities that are being released from incarceration and you know what is next in terms of upcoming programs that address some of these issues well, thank you for that um richard yes so um right now uh, we have um people that are coming out of incarceration they are working with glitz and um, cheyenne and queens and they're doing an amazing job with their um, re-entry program, as well as we have partnered with the Osborne Association with um, Grace um, Detreva. And the programs are amazing. And right now during COVID-19, we are still 
housing um, homeless people, right? Um, they are still releasing people from incarceration during this time. So uh, what that looks like is through Glitz, they are putting people into Airbnbs and they are quarantining for 14 days. And from there, they are put into the next phase, which is a house. Um, they, they have houses in Queens that they are um, housing the community in well as they go to the programs at the Osborne Association. Um, with Princess Janae Place, we have funding through Gilead where we can put people into permanent apartments, right? We, we use the funding to pay the first month rent and security to get them started on their way. But um, right now due to COVID, we have used some of the funds to put people into motels for, for the first couple of days until we can get them situated. And we've been doing um, the best that we can at this moment, but um, there's more that needs to be done, right? And uh, we've, we've been working with uh, CK Life, uh, Ms. Kim Watson, she works at the pantry uh, twice a week, and we've been sending our members and clients down to the pantry to get food. So we're still working, you know, during this time. And, and it's rough, right? Because we're one of the bottom grassroots organizations, you know, we, we don't have funding like some of the other um, organizations, I, I don't want to name drop, you know, but, you know, we're, we're, we're still doing it, right? And um, we're not contracted by the Department of Homeless Shelter. We're doing this with um, our own funds, with the community funds, from crowdfunding. And you all are making this happen, you know, the, the people that are watching know, from your generous donations. Um, we appreciate this because like I said earlier that we are a resilient bunch of people, the LGBT community, the queer community, and we have always taken care of one another. And this is where the house and ballroom scene also comes in at. And we will continue to take care of our people, you know, because this, this doesn't stop right now. This is, we're still pushing. This is a push. Mm -hmm. One of thank you for that, and just um, one of the things that I heard you mention in in the conversation you had with Antoine uh, a few days ago is like when you talked about your transition experience, and you mentioned something that uh, that said uh, when you transitioned you didn't know that people would fear you. Yes. Why? Why? Why that? Why did you? Yeah. Bring so that up? I I can definitely talk a little about that. So. Um, at the beginning of my transition, um, being a tomboy, still, um, you know, going to the lesbian clubs because I was a lesbian, right? And I was fine navigating through the, the club scene. And like I said, I, I did um, drag. I was a drag king and, and I performed I Crash, Escuelita and all these places. And so um, when, when I started my journey, I was already mistaken for a young man and they, you know, I would go to the bathroom and the women would be like, you're in the wrong room. And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm not in the wrong bathroom. Right. And my voice wasn't as deep as it is now, but um, I, I went to the bathroom and did what I had to do and, and left. But as I started my journey and I started to get more facial hair, it became more of people were scared of me because I'm a, I'm a man now, right? And not only that, but I'm a black man. I transition from a black woman, I, I was in my 30s, to a black man. And black men in America are perceived to be a threat. And I didn't know that, it didn't, it didn't hit me until I went in the elevator, and there was a woman in the elevator and I walked in, the doors closed, and I looked and I smiled, and she kind of like had her purse and shunned away. And I was like, what just happened? And that's when it, it dawned on me that I can no longer address people and, and smile and be that friendly person because I'm perceived to be a threat as a black man. And even with children, you know, I'm, I'm great with kids. And anyone that has kids and has left their kids with me, they know, you know, Uncle Javon loves kids. And um, I have five kids now with me, right? 
But um, I I used to always you know play with kids. Hey, cutie, you know like that. But as a black man, you have to be careful because I I, I went to, and I and I, I you know say hey, you so cute, hi, and I grabbed her, gra- grabbed his child. Like, what type of sick guy are you? Like, you know, talking to my child like you don't know us. And I was like, oh, you know, I had to I had to get a reality check that. As a black man, you have to be careful of how you address people, children, and I, I, I didn't know this before. You know, I, I had no one to, to tell me the ins and outs and be careful, you know, don't go on that block because, you know, it, it's, it's predominantly white and, and, and we're going through that block. They've never seen black people before. Be careful. Don't go in that part of Brooklyn. I had nobody to tell me that. I had to find these things out on my own. Yeah, it was rough. Mm-hmm. Thank you, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure some of that feeds into the work that you do at, at Princess Janae Place for some of the families of that come there, because you know, I've, I've seen some of the photographs of some of the events that you, you held there, and you know, it seems like a place that's also welcoming to everybody and their families. So. Um, Thank you for that. I, I want to go on to Antoine um, because I know, I feel like this has been the summer that we've been spending the most time together. But, um, you know, you work a lot with the DM organization. Um, you work a lot with, very hard on the In My Mind conference, which we'll be hosting virtually this year at the center. But I want to talk to you a little bit about um, the topic of mental health, especially when we talk about mental health in black and brown communities and why you felt like this was important to start talking about. I, I, I know that when we talk about mental health in, in people of color communities, it's always or can be a very taboo topic. So I'm just curious from, from your own experience, you know, what led you to come to this place where you said that this is what you wanted to start doing and you wanted people to know about and things that have happened since then. Thank you very much again, Richard, for um, giving me this opportunity to be part of this and especially about this discussion on race and mental health in our communities. Um, I, 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 I can say that perhaps in a large part, mental health has always been part of my life. I tell people in jest that I grew up in a mental asylum. Um, My mother was a nurse at a mental health asylum in Guyana, and she would often take me with her to work as a child, and I had the run of the entire place. So I could say that I enjoyed, you know, I grew up there in a sense. But in later years, I've come to realize that um, in my family, there has been a significant issue of mental health in in the family, um, represented in various forms, in in significant depression um, and some forms of other kinds of abnormal um, uh, personality disorders and stuff. And I question to understand, well, how was mental health present in my life as well? Um, And I talk about this a couple of times where, um, when in 1999, I stood at the end of the number number one uptown platform at 34th Street and contemplated jumping in front of the train, that that became for me a moment of realization that not only was I dealing with depression, but I was also dealing with uh, suicidal ideation that comes from that depression. And then on top of that, to recognize that we are not having conversations about mental health, that this is something that is still taboo in our communities, that I remember when I told my mother that I was seeing a therapist to talk about mental health, she asked me if I was crazy, um, which is kind of like, are you mad? Uh, Because in Guyanese culture, in our Creole culture, um, when you talk about somebody being mad, there would literally be somebody whose family was mad or crazy, or they were seen as less than. And it's a conversation we don't have. Um, It's a conversation that anyone who, expresses or demonstrates that there may be something not quite right to that person, that that person is not complete. Um, Our societies from colonialism onwards has encouraged a kind of uh, an environment or a culture that is 
always strong. You're always prepared. You're always doing. You're always going about. And so anything that's less than is seen to be weak, lazy, in, ineffective, not a proper member of society. And so also recognizing that there is a lot of shame and stigma surrounding talking about mental health and recognizing that that has its roots also in slavery. That, for example, one of the things that the slave masters and the slave owners did is they separated families. And many families would choose death rather than separation. And so if there was a member of the family who was struggling with a mental health disorder, they didn't know what it was, but it was always, look, keep quiet. Don't talk about it. Don't let the master know what's going on. So that to prevent that family member from being separated, because in those families, they recognized that that family member needed a little extra care, a little extra attention. And so there's, so then through the centuries, it became, don't talk about it in our communities. Don't talk about it. Don't let anybody know. Just keep it quiet. And that began to have an effect that in the sense that if something is wrong with me, I am not going to talk about it. I am not going to let anyone know about it because I don't want anybody to judge me or to discriminate against me or to stigmatize me. And then you've got in the black community, not just here in the United States, but throughout the rest of the world, you've got in the black community and in, that has become an inherent distrust of anything that is medical, anything that has got health care. And more importantly, for black Americans, you've got the issue of the Tuskegee experiment. You've got the, 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 the history of, of, the white, of the white gynecologist who experimented on black women without anesthesia. So there is an inherent also distrust of anything that comes out of the medical field, which is what, which is what mental health is. But we've also got in, in the black community, we've got the, the issue that mental health care is something that really and truly came to be codified in the late, in the mid to late 1800s. And in the mid, in, in the 1920s and 30s with Sigmund Freud become more, more mainstream. So mental health is somewhat relatively new. And one of the things that we've got that in the black community we are dealing with or we are seeing is that there are mental health professionals who may be black or even white, but the mental health training that they have is a Western European construct. And so it does not necessarily relate to black people because it's never really designed for black people. And so what we are seeing currently is that there are increasing numbers of black mental health professionals who are embracing what it means to be black as part of their therapeutic process. So they are in fact bringing into their therapy both the Western construct, but tailored to um, a black consciousness, a black awareness. Does that make sense? Yeah. There's, um, I just want to point out someone who, the, our, my, my good friend, Debbie Quinones, who asked this question that you'll see below. She's mentioned trauma-informed care principles are worth a review. Can you, can you share anything about that or what your thoughts are on that? And then we'll move on to Muhammad. Yeah, that's, 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 a key, that's a key component. Because the person who just asked the question about trauma I was having a conversation early this afternoon with another family member, and it became apparent. I've I've learned this. I've seen. I've I've, I've watched this process. That trauma from my great grandmother was passed on to my grandmother and on to my mother. And so, for example, there is a woman, uh, Professor Sarah Gray from Tulane University, who in November 2018. Published in published an article that talked about maternal transgenerational trauma, but there is also mm -hmm. the, um, the 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 um, the one of the most noted professors on neuropsychology, Bessel van der Kirk, who talks about um, trauma's effect on a person's prefrontal cortex, how trauma impacts our neuropsychology. But more importantly, I think, is, is the work by Joy DeGruy, 
who talks about the post-traumatic slave syndrome. And what we, what, what we have to understand is that for black and people of color, racism is just another aspect of that trauma. That trauma that black people are dealing with today is compounded trauma. It's trauma that we have inherited from slavery, from the separation from Africa, from the separation of our family members. It's that trauma, mm -hmm. the abuse, the, the violence that's perpetuated against our bodies and our minds that has passed on through the years. And so consider that many of our parents and our grandparents experienced trauma in their own lives, passed that trauma on to us, and the trauma that we ourselves are experiencing and living with today, including the trauma of seeing George Floyd's death play out every time on that video that is continuous vicarious trauma that says to us, am I next? Am I going to be the next one? And then to consider that there is actual research that says that black children who have witnessed and seen and heard trauma, it begins to affect their amygdala in their brains. Their, their amygdala, the hypothalamus gets flooded with cortisol, which is a stress hormone that reduces the size of the amygdala and the hypothalamus and impacts their ability to learn. It impacts their, their emotional development. So from childhood, they are, tra they are traumatized. So when we talk about children being arrested development, let's talk about the trauma that's affecting them. And let's look at ourselves as adults today. How many of us as children, because of trauma, our own childhood was arrested and we are still living in a trauma, in a traumatic fog that we don't understand. We have not grown as adults because we're still stuck in that childhood trauma that we are not a, that 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 we haven't recovered from. Thank you. That is, I mean, I think we're all in agreement that we are like, these are things that we need to be talking about more, but not just talking about it, but taking action to rectify, right? Because, you know, we can talk about these things 12 ways to Sunday, but, you know, definitely being involved in that. When you were saying that, uh, you know, it, it made me think about um, my, my family in terms of, you know, being a Puerto Rican queer person uh, that grew up in a Pentecostal household, right? Where the minute that I came out, the first thing that was on my mother's mind was that, oh, so you're gonna get AIDS, right? They equated like homosexuality with that. And so I think sometimes too, it's like the, the trauma behind like how queerness is perceived and what that means from, you know, specific backgrounds. Like, I, you know, in, in that case for me, like that was one of the experiences that, that I felt um, like I didn't, I, I had panic attacks years after that you know, because every encounter that I had with a person was like, I got it. I got it today. Like, or, you know, and so I, I think it still happens on in, in different ways, but, you know, it, it made me think of that. So thank you for, for talking about that. And we'll obviously talk about this some more um, as we continue to explore, like, things that we're, we're talking about and working on. But I want to make sure to give Mohammed some time to, to talk a little bit because I do want to go back to the, um, the exhibition that we talked about because, you know, when we spoke about it, it was like we spoke about this project maybe like in March of last year um, and we had an exhibit already set up so we weren't able to do it during the summer but we did it in September, October of 2019. And, you know, one of the things that was really important about that kind of exhibition was about visibility and representation in spaces like the center. And so I just want to talk to you about that and, you know, why, why you felt like it was important, not just to have that exhibit at the center, but to have that exhibit period, because you, you and I agree that we saw all these Stonewall 50th exhibition, they were very rarely like people of color, even though they were like a part of it, like uh, wasn't like it was like the main thing. And this was like the only Caribbean, queer Caribbean, Indo-Caribbean exhibition 
which is very greatly curated and done. And, and so we'd love to talk to you a, a little bit more about that. And then the second part to that question, just for timing too, is like, you know, when we talk about how we experience forms of racism, not just from outside of our organization, but within the organizations, especially something like, you know, the Caribbean Equality Project, where you have people that are coming from all parts of the Caribbean that have all kinds of faiths from, you know, just like being Christian to Pentecostal and so on and so forth. So how do those things factor into organizing with, with Caribbean organizations that are coming from all over the place? Thank you for that question, Richard. I will say we wanted to first celebrate the pioneers that have been doing this work in New York City. And I mentioned some of those folks earlier, um, including Dominic Jackson, Kim Watson, Colin Robinson. These are all pioneers that, have, that started to create visibility and representation for Caribbean culture and Caribbean LGBTQ folks in New York City. And during the Stonewall 50th last year, there were so many exhibitions, as you mentioned, there were so many spaces being created to celebrate queerness in New York City and transness in New York City, but there were none for Caribbean identities. And when we talk about equity in funding, as a volunteer-led organization, we reached out to so many different organizations and groups, and we were told that all the funding was used up. So the money that we raised to curate the Queer Caribbeans of NYC exhibit came from community members. It came from partners that we've worked with for the past five years. So this beautiful curated exhibition that you saw and the community saw was funded by community members that wanted to see black and brown Caribbean immigrants on the walls of the LGBT center. And it was, it was important for me to host it at the center because in 2000, when 9-11 happened, the center was not the most affirming space for LGBTQ Muslim. And as an Indo-Caribbean queer Muslim person, I wanted to reclaim a space that was meant and created for all LGBTQ people. And that also includes working with the center to create the LGBTQ iftar. And for the past four years, well, three years, this year we didn't host it, but for the past three years, we've been hosting a queer affirming iftar at the LGBT center. And when we talk about creating spaces in New York City that celebrates transness and Caribbeanness and Indo-Caribbeanness and queerness, the center is supposed to be that space that affirms and welcomes all of us. And 15 years ago, 10 years ago, it, it wasn't. There are still black and brown, queer and trans people that goes to the center that experience racism. And they come to organizations like the Caribbean Equality Project, sometimes that are not necessarily um, culturally competent. The one thing I am super grateful for is the immigration group that the center has. It's titled Immigration Group, and I love the, I love the title of it but everyone that's considered an immigrant is put into this one group. And when we talk about diversity, when we talk about intersectionality, some of the folks in that group don't even speak the same language. And it's so difficult for some of them to communicate and build relationships and build network of support with each other. The one affirming thing that the center has definitely done to uplift the Caribbean Equality Project's work it's opened its door for us, right? And not only opening its door for the Caribbean Equality Project, but also our communities. Now, five years of doing this work, many of our community members, many of our unchained members are have come from the center. They are literally saying, I was recommended to you from the center. When it comes to just talking about what race and intersectionality looks like in this work, we talked about funding earlier. Caribbean Quality Project is still very much volunteer led, but we are doing this work because we need to continue being visible. We need to continue letting the larger, the larger LGBTQ community know that this work needs to be done through an intersectional lens. LGBTQ immigrants are coming to the US for safety, for protection, and to be affirmed. 
And if New York City, if the New York City LGBTQ organizations are not creating those space, if they're not culturally competent, then that funding that they are receiving to, ser- to serve all of us needs to be diverted to LGBTQ groups, particularly LGBTQ immigrant groups that are doing the work on the ground work to make sure that they are protecting their communities and affirming their communities. And that also includes healthcare, it includes immigration services, it includes health services, it includes culturally competent programming, and not just once a year where we celebrate pride and we want to be inclusive, it's year round. So uh, these are all things that the Caribbean Equality Project has been working to make sure that our, our immigrant population are not only being served and being affirmed, but to also make sure they're not tokenized for funding in New York City. And Richard, also, can you just repeat the last question you had? The question was around um, like navigating within organizations that have members that are coming from different parts of the Caribbean, you know, that have their own either histories of trauma or have their own like upbringing and so on and so forth, like how that has been for you as an organizer to have to work with people that are, you know, from Trinidad versus Jamaica versus, you know, um, Guyana from where you're from and some of the histories that are involved in that. Like when we look at certain places in the Caribbean, there aren't, there, there are places that, you know, being queer is a death sentence, right? So, that being said, when you have people that come from places like that, they do carry some of those histories of trauma. And so how do we, you know, or like you as an organizer of this organization that is meant to like represent or provide them with space and resources, navigate not just that story from where they're coming from, but then that story coming into a place like New York, where then they're faced with the other factors of race and racism within the city? Yeah. That's a really a lot of question <laughs> because many of the community members that we engage with, it starts with education in, and also basic pronouns. Many of the organizations in the Caribbean are, the community members are not accustomed to even being asked what their pronouns are. So it starts with educating our community members. And many of the community members are also coming here, fleeing violence, fleeing family rejection. But there are also community members that have family members in New York that are affirming and supportive. And they want to be able to share spaces with those folks, right? So we have currently, Caribbean Equality Project has been serving as a bridge. We have been working with organizations like Sasad in Guyana, Kaiso in Trinidad and Tobago, Transwave in Jamaica, um, United and Strong in St. Lucia. So these are different groups that we're working with. The leaders on the ground are connecting us to community members that are migrating to New York, particularly New York City, because that's where we're based. And community members will get here, they will connect with us and they'll say, I have nowhere to go. I'm gonna be couch surfing for a few days, but I need housing, where can I go? Mm-hmm. And we recommend, we connect we connect them with her, um, services, housing services. If they're a young person, the Alifornia Center has been like the go-to for us. Currently, we have over we have about four or five young people that are living at the Alifornia Center that are recipients of the Caribbean Quality Project's COVID-19 emergency fund. And this is also how community members are being impacted, right? Immigrants are coming to the U.S. and they're now trapped at home with their abusive family members. And the, this is what the work that we're doing. We have community members that are coming to our on-chain program that are literally walking around their block just to be in a safe space, just to talk about the traumas that they're experiencing during COVID-19. And this work this doesn't stop because we are all home. Our community members, as, as we, many of us know, our home is a place of violence for many of us. And we cannot escape that violence if it means that that's our only survival. If we're on the streets and we don't have an income and we don't have food to sustain ourselves, we have to be living with violent, homophobic, triggering family members. Mm-hmm. And you know, in this work itself, we're dealing with racism. Racism also exists within the Caribbean itself. I am, I'm from Guyana, such as Antoine. 
And I'm not quite sure what Antoine's experience was with racism, but I've also experienced racism in my own country. I've experienced racism and anti-Blackness within my own family. I've had to re-educate my parents on how to engage with my friends that are Black. I've had to correct my parents on the language that they have been accustomed to using on how to talk about the Black community. Mm-hmm. So when this is also being done even within the queer and trans community that, that are Caribbean folks, particularly within the Indo-Caribbean community as well. So I think right now, COVID-19 has, we know it has dis- disproportionately affect Black and brown communities, but it, Black and brown communities, but it has, it has also affected Black and brown LGBTQ immigrants, Black and brown queer and trans people in New York City. And so many city agencies that are putting out information that is meant to be communicated to all of us, it's not reaching us. First of all, the city did not put out information in different languages to communicate with the immigrants in New York City. Mm -hmm. Undocumented people do not qualify for unemployment. They do not qualify for benefits. How are they surviving? Our asylum seekers are literally contacting CEP for funding. We have been sustaining our community members to our COVID-19 fund. We have been on the phone doing rent negotiation just to avoid harassment, just to keep our community members safe during COVID-19. Thank you for thank you for, for sharing. Thank you all for sharing every all, like all the information that you did with us. We have to wrap up now. Um, and what you just said, uh, Mohammed, is speaks to the next question. But in a brief one minute, um, just next steps of things that you're working on right now. I know you mentioned the COVID relief fund. Um, so if you could just all of us just say, um, you know, a brief one minute of next steps. I guess I'll go. Uh, you. Yeah. Yeah. So one, I think the center could use its platform to uplift grassroots organizations that are raising funds to support LGBTQ immigrants. So I would love the center to post our COVID-19 relief fund on there asking for donations. Uh, we have raised over $20,000 to support community members We have distributed 19,000 of that money to over 80 community members, which have supported them with housing, living expenses, metro cards for those that are working reduced hours, food insecurity. These are all issues that COVID-19 has amplified. And as queer and trans people on this panel, we know these are all issues that have been affecting our community members. COVID-19 has just amplified all of it. So folks that are watching can go to CaribbeanEqualityProject.org, make a donation for larger organizations that are doing this work. We know they have funding. Divert some of that money to grassroots organizations, such as those that are on this panel. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Carmen. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for having me as well. Um, I echo what Mohammed said. For us, we are focusing on some economic health and wellness programming as we shift to not only just doing pride, we're implementing various programs over our helping the community improve its physical, mental, and economic health and wellness. And we're getting started with a entrepreneur workshop because some of our community members can't get that nine to five because the employers are discriminatory for either presentation or whatever it may be. So we are helping people work for themselves and do for themselves. So that's one thing we have coming up uh, that will actually kick off in 2021. We already have some funding for that and we're very happy for that. Another thing is our physical health and wellness. We will start instituting some fitness programming Some of it, uh, we're working with some trans community members for trans specific fitness uh, for comfort levels, et cetera, and some general fitness things. We were planning a fitness walk uh, that has uh, challenged us with COVID-19. So what we may do depending on how things look because all of these programs start in 2021 is do a virtual fitness walk. So those are just a few of the programs that we have coming forward. And uh, yes, we'd love for the center to uh, post our information as well. And uh, we can certainly use donations to help get these programs off the ground. We're writing grants for them. 
But in terms of fundraising, uh, we would love if the senator supported us by putting our donation page up, et cetera. So uh, thank you again for having me and I've appreciated this opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carmen. And yes, we will we will work on some of the two points that you, you all brought up um, and we'll continue to have these conversations. And Antoine, it's up to you. Well, thanks and again, uh, Richard, for um, having me as part of this panel. And I'm actually really impressed with the fact that um, you guys are doing this, given some of the center's own history surrounding race. So I'm really glad that you're doing this. Um, and I hope it's not the end. I hope this really continues to invest an ongoing conversation. So I'm really, I'm really proud about that. Um, I was really impressed to know that this is actually being streamed all over the place. So I'm seeing all the comments and chats coming in. Um, what we are doing at DBGM is that um, what we're doing at DBGM is that we we started um, an, on a, a Facebook group called I am here calling calling you um, call ten. Um, when what we what we started to do was to start invite people to call ten people because if somebody has a phone and they're locked down in COVID nineteen, especially if they're living uh, by themselves, um, hearing somebody's voice on the phone might might be able to help them check on them whatever but what we also started doing is recognizing that many in our communities um are struggling with a lot of issues so we started doing a series of weekly discussion fora examining specific issues to our own communities so yes last week we did one with Javon where we talked about homelessness okay lgbt people of color who are homeless and how that impacts their mental health. This week we are talking about um, this week. We, last week we talked about incarceration. Um, this week we are talking about um, we are we are we are talking about domestic violence. We are talking about um, about the elderly. We are talking about um, we we you know we talked about alcohol and drug and substance use. Um, which kind of like seems strange that when we went into lockdown, the governor said that that liquor stores can remain open. Um, that kind of seemed counterintuitive for a number of reasons, and there are a lot of pros and cons for that and against it. I'm not going to touch that. Um, but also, what we what what we're working on is is the conference that's coming up in October. Um, it's going to be a virtual conference instead of the two day conference. It's going to be a one day conference. Um, from 10 to 5.30, but also we just got a small grant and we are starting an online, two online groups in, um, in July 27. Um, one is for gay men of color who are struggling with mental health as a way to prevent HIV infection or transmission. And the other group is a group for women of color or mother-like figures of color. So these are, this is for a group of women, regardless of their sexual orientation or gender identity. But these are for mother-like figures whose sons may have died from HIV AIDS or suicide so that these women can grieve, can mourn, and they can heal. So we are starting those two groups in Brooklyn um, as, as groups for these women and for gay men. Um, to begin their healing process. So that's all, I mean, for now. Thank you. Uh, Javon, final yes. words. Yes, he left me with like a minute and 30 seconds. So um, the um, August 30th is the homeless uh, walk. It will be virtual. Um, if by any chance that our permit does um, get approved to have people in Van Cortlandt Park. We will let everyone know. And Carmen, we can work together to have this fitness and uh, virtual walk to help the homeless. You can go on our website and um, get all the information. You can email us info at princessjanaeplace.org as well as know that your donations go directly to help trans people, LGB people um, to um, obtain housing, um, legal services, mental health, 
to get the Metro cards. It goes directly to them. And I'm saying this because we joined with the National Black Trans Liberation Movement um, recently. And today is um, Trans Pride under the National Black Trans Liberation Movement. And um, we were going to give five people um, um, $500 each, but we changed it and we're going to give 25 people $100 each today. So follow my um, social media and so that you can um, see the five trans, the 25 trans people that will receive $100 to pay their bills because that's how we take care of our community. We help pay somebody's cell phone bill so they can join the call 10. All right. Thank you. So I, I just wanted to say thank you all for, for sharing this information with us. Obviously, this is not the end of the conversation. This is only part of the beginning. You know, we, we need to continue having these conversations. So I really do hope to continue this conversation as well as to continue working with you. So I know, Antoine, I'll probably see you next week. So, um, so thank you again, and I hope to see you soon.